In this video, we are going to go over characteristics of the securities used for long-term financing. When we say long-term financing, you can think of it uh, longer than a year, but typically several, several years, or with intent for it to be several years down the line. So pretty much all your securities, with exception that short-term debt, is a long-term form of financing. So your long-term debt, mostly, which you see there's bonds, but long-term commercial loans will be there as well. Uh, common stock and preferred stock. All these are used for long-term financing. Let's talk about some features of common stock. Uh, you have voting rights. You have proxy voting, classes of stock also. Uh, voting rights and proxy voting, small differences, but it's still voting on, on decisions for the company board, CEO, things like that. Uh, classes of uh, stock, uh, some companies, and this is not preferred versus common, within common stock, you may have class A, class B. Uh, a good example, famous stock out there would be the Warren Buffett stock, the Berkshire Hathaway stock, the Class A being the most expensive stock in the world. And you can go ahead and look at Yahoo Finance or wherever you like to look at stock prices and then compare that to the same stock, but the Class B stocks. Very, very different uh, to stock prices. We used to have that vary, but it's pretty much just uh, uh, financial management. Uh, but yes, they could be Class A, Class B, et cetera. Uh, there's some other rights that come with it as well. Uh, share proportionally in declared dividends. Um, so if you have one stock versus 100 stock, you get a uh, dividend per share. Share proportionally and remaining assets during liquidation. So let's say a company has a, declares bankruptcy or is driven into bankruptcy and they have to liquidate the assets. Uh, once... A lot of other things get paid because if you're a common stockholder, uh, getting money after bankruptcy, you have to wait for a lot of other people to get paid first. But if there's money remaining, then it gets divided equally per share. Preemptive right, the right to purchase new stock issued so as to maintain proportional ownership. So what happens is that if a company issues new stock, then the value of the stock you have now gets diluted. So what you do is you have the right before other people have access to buy the new shares being issued, to buy some in order to uh, keep your ownership percentage, if you want to put it that way, uh, but it's at your own discretion. Uh, sometimes those uh, early or pre-purchases, if you want to put it that way, uh, they may sell to you at a special price, but it's not necessary, but it could be. And you have rights to dividends if, they're, if they do pay dividends. Features of preferred stock. Now, preferred stock is different from common stock. Uh, they have dividends as well. Uh, stated dividend must be paid before dividends can be paid to common stockholders. So if you own preferred stock, the cash the company has available to pay dividends, they first have to pay out the dividends owed to preferred stockholders. And then the cash left or after that can be distributed to common stockholders. Uh, dividends are not a liability to the firm, but dividends never are, whether it's common stock or preferred stock. Now, there is a bit of a difference. A preferred stockholder, if they don't get their dividend because a company was low in cash, the way they react to that will be much different with the market out there in common stock reacts when a dividend is omitted or cannot be paid. However, that's for a different uh, discussion. But the point is that dividends do not have to be paid. It's just so they have the cash. Now, it's a really bad look. If they don't, maybe very bad look, very bad uh, signal they send to the market if they cannot pay out dividends, but it does happen from time to time. And it's more about the reason why it wasn't paid out. And preferred dividends can be deferred indefinitely. 
So deferred, meaning if they're cumulative. So, and that's the next bullet. Most preferred dividends are cumulative. What that means is that if I was supposed to pay you a dollar dividend this year, but I couldn't pay it to you, I still owe you that dollar. Next year, now I owe you $2, if, assuming it was like a dollar per year. Uh, and it accumulates. Every time you miss one, then it just gets rolled over. Now, they don't have to be. That says most. It's very common, but they not they do not have to be. And then the cases that they're not cumulative, if they miss it, they miss it. You don't get the money, and it's not going to roll over to the next uh, quarter, year, whenever it happens. Uh, preferred stock generally does not carry voting rights. That is true. They generally don't. The reason to buy preferred stock is to have a claim on the cash and assets of the company before common stock does. Let's talk about long-term debt and we'll compare it to equity stock. In other words, common stock in this case. So debt is not an ownership interest. It's just a loan. They just lent money out. Now, if there's collateral, then they have a claim on that property, but it's not an ownership interest per se. You can claim later and become owner of some assets, but not it's not automatic. Creditors do not have voting rights. They never do. Interest is considered a cost of doing business and is tax deductible. So any interest you pay, you can deduct from taxes. But things like dividends on the common stock, you do not. Creditors have legal recourse if interest or principal payments are missed. And by legal recourse, uh, as I mentioned, they could seize assets if it's within the the contract of the debt, or in extreme cases, the next bullet, it can lead to bankruptcy. So excess debt can lead to financial distress and bankruptcy, but not just excess debt. You can have regular debt, but all of a sudden you have problem generating cash in your business for low revenues or whatever the X, Y reason, and you can't pay, they can, the debt holders can then drive you to bankruptcy in order to make a claim on your assets to recover their money. Equity, uh, the, it is ownership interest. So you're sharing the risk with the company. Uh, common stockholders vote on the board of directors on other issues. Uh, so they have voting rights. Dividends are not considered a cost of doing business and are not tax deductible. Dividends are not a liability of the firm. Debt is a liability. And stockholders have no legal recourse if dividends are not paid. An all equity firm cannot go bankrupt. What that means, it's strictly talking about the legal definition of bankruptcy. You may shut down. It's just that we uh, we can't we use the word we commonly use the word bankruptcy as when a business goes under. Uh, no, bankruptcy is a very specific situation where. Assets are, are, are seized and liquidated, or there's a restructuring of the company uh, mandated by the court system, both. So we're talking about the legal term of bankruptcy. If you're in all equity, you just shut down. You stop being a business. The bond indenture. Okay, so long-term debt bond is what we commonly use a lot uh, in corporate finance but it doesn't have to be bonds only but we, we are talking when we are talking about bonds we can start with the indenture indenture is the contract so it's a nice word that we use not to be confused with debenture we will define debenture in a minute indenture it's just a contract and at a minimum it can have a lot more written in it at the minimum, we'll have those things, the basic terms of the bonds, <clears throat> the total amount of bonds issued, <clears throat> a description of property used as security, if applicable. In other words, if, if it's, a, it's a collateral, if there are assets being used as collateral, but do they do not have to be. Sink and fund provisions, that, uh, that's an example of that is as you get payments, the principal on the bond starts going down to where you end up with zero value at the end, like you would do with a regular loan. Call provisions, that's if the bond, uh, the bond can be 
call back, like we call a recall, recall of bonds before it matures. Uh, details of protective covenants. Covenants, a uh, quick example, when the bond gets issued, and this also applies to commercial loans, there might be some restrictions of what the company can and cannot do uh, or maintain certain cash balance, certain ratios. So if they operate outside or fall outside certain parameters, then they ask uh, some action or, or, or some course of action or some kind of a, a activity, something will happen if the company, because if the company changes risk, then this affects the bondholders. That's what it comes out to. So covenants, protective covenants is you can and cannot do this, or you need to stay within these parameters. If you do not, we can start making claims. Bond classifications. You got reg register with bear form uh, bonds. Then you got the uh, uh, it's a security. So let's talk about collateral. As we mentioned, secured by financial securities. Now it says financial securities. Uh, you could use stock as collateral uh, or other assets in the company. It doesn't have to be securities in the sense that you're typically familiar with. Mortgage, secured by real property as in real estate. Normally land or building. Debentures, unsecured, that's pretty much a signature loan. They just trusting that you'll pay. Obviously consider riskier. Notes, you hear notes a lot. Unsecured debt with original maturity less than 10 years. That's your kind of rule of thumb, the standard approach. And seniority, as in if, just like preferred stock gets paid before common stock, senior debt gets paid before junior debt or subordinate debt. One thing not mentioned in the previous slide or this slide, it's um, convertible bonds. That's another thing that happens where the company may say at any given time, hey, thank you for letting us the money bonds, but what we're going to do is here's some stock. Now you own stock. You don't own this bond. So they convert the bond into stock. And all, everything changes, as we mentioned before. Now you have ownership interest, you get dividends, not interest. Uh, etc. Required yields. Okay, so the bonds have this thing called the coupon rate. Now, the coupon rate depends on the risk characteristics of the bond when issued, uh, the risk of the company, uh, what's going on in the market. There's a lot of things that influence. So at the moment they get issued, the intent is for the coupon rate to reflect the interest that XYZ project or company would pay at certain level of risk. So it's a risk return situation. But what happens is once the coupon rate is established and out there, it cannot be changed, but the market is gonna change. Similar risk companies are they gonna go up or down and that's why the bond price changes. So, but going back to risk return, the same company at the same time may have different types of bonds out there with different coupons, but it's because the characteristics are different. So here are a couple of examples. They're saying which bonds will have higher coupon all else equal. That's important. Assuming everything else is the same, and this is the only one difference they have. Secure debt, meaning there's collateral, some kind of a financial security or asset versus a debenture. A debenture is when there's no collateral. So there's no collateral, there's a signature loan that will be considered higher risk. Higher risk should have higher returns. So that in that first bullet, the debenture should have a higher coupon rate because it's unsecured debt. Subordinated debenture versus senior debt. For this one, you don't even need the word debenture. It just makes it even riskier. But really just the fact that subordinated versus senior, senior, gets paid first if there's cash available before subordinated. So this people have more risk and you would expect in the senior debt to have a lower coupon rate. This one will have a higher coupon rate because it's riskier because they don't wait, they wait. And then the fact that it's debenture makes it even riskier bumping up that coupon rate, coupon rate even higher. A bond with a sinking fund versus one without. 
As mentioned earlier, a feature of the sinking fund is that you start recovering, recovering some of the principal before the maturity date. So as you are recovering the money you put in or you lent out, put it that way, uh, your, list, your risk is going down. So this one will be considered less risky than this one. So this one would have the one without should have a higher coupon rate. A callable bond versus a non-callable bond, where <clears throat> all else equal, this has the risk of being called back. Now, typically when they get re uh, called back, you do get compensated accordingly, but because it may throw off your portfolio, you can't plan it, you don't know when they may call it even if they do. So that uncertainty is what adding the risk. There's more uncertainty in a callable bond than one without. So more risk, you would expect higher compensation. Here are just some different types of bonds and there's many more, there's just a few. Uh, convertible bonds, that's the one we mentioned earlier where they might convert them to stock if the company wants to income bonds means that they you do get some kind of coupon payments kind of cash payment uh floating rate bonds just what it sounds like all bonds will have a fixed coupon rate unless you have a floating rate bond that's just a variable variable interest rate as the interest rate rate fluctuates in the market it will fluctuate for you as a bond holder uh, in that case, you are taking more risk and the company has less risk. You would expect a floating rate bond to have a starting coupon rate a little higher. Zero coupon bonds. This is like your government bonds, for example, but it doesn't have to be government. But the point is that there is no payments in between. If you buy a 10-year bond, what you do is you buy it for less money now. And in 10 years, you get more money, the face value but there's not, no payments in between, you just sit around and wait. It's gaining value to you as it gets closer to the maturity date and you can sell it and that and you can collect whatever gain you had between now and then, but uh, the actual bond, whole, uh, the, the seller of the bond will not make any payments until the end. Bank loans, uh, another form of long-term debt, you got lines of credit. Provide a maximum amount the bank is willing to lend if guaranteed, referred to as revolving line of credit. Uh, pretty much they say, hey, here's a million dollars and uh, you, don't, you don't get the million dollars, you just have access to a million dollars. And as you use it, you pay interest in the amounts you use. And then as you pay it down, just like a credit card, you can go ahead and uh, uh, then continue using that money. Syndicated loan, large money center banks frequently have more demand for loans than they have supply. Small regional banks are often in the opposite situation. As a result, a larger money center bank may arrange a loan with a firm or country and then sell portions of the loan to syndicate of other banks. A syndicated loan may be publicly traded. All that, the quick oversimplified way is somebody needs a lot of money and one single bank may not be able to handle it for X, Y reason. They're not the cash, their ratios that are mandated by government uh, won't be able to meet it. So they just uh, team up with the banks. That's really what happens. A loan that is super large, sometimes very well, the larger the, the amount borrowed automatically increases the risk, but it is a whole risk situation as well, but mostly has to do with the amount of the loan. And all they do is just team up with other banks. International bonds. Yes, same thing. So we got euro bonds, bonds denominated in a particular currency and issued simultaneously in the bond markets of several countries. Foreign bonds. Just like some like bonds issued in another nation's capital market, <laughs> nation's capital market by a foreign borrower. So U.S. bonds in outside 
uh, then that's a Yankee bond. And you see the rest there. They got very colorful names. Patterns of financing, what's the trend? So for these financing, we talked about how people, uh, companies go to the financial markets to get cash for financing in long term. However, you may use internal funds, cash on hand, retain earnings, et cetera, first if you want to before you start borrowing money or selling shares. Uh, or for stock or the other ones. Um, so there's this thing in finance called the pecking order, which states that internal funds are the cheapest way of funds. So use the money you have first. Then if you need more, then you go to borrow money. That's the second, typically, typically the second cheapest form of, of, of financing and then go into a uh, common stock. Now, uh, arguments are made about the opportunity cost of using internal funds. If your equity it's, comes at a higher cost than debt, but then there's a transaction cost also. If you try to raise capital, there's a lot of uh, transaction costs, floating costs that may then increase the cost of trying to seek outside financing. And then time. Internal funds are, ready, are available and ready right away. The other ones, you have to go through a process. Okay, so that's it for this video. See you on the next one.